So this is just a quick recap of the um, kind of techniques and things that we were talking about in today's um, today's lecture, where we were trying to look at new situations and, and work out what um, spectroscopies would be best to apply. So in this case, what I have is I have a um, a dye, which I've said is non-fluorescent in free solution, um, and then has a emission quantum yield, fluorescence quantum yield of 0.45, and there's a slight loss of emission in the presence of O2. Um, therefore, it's assumed to be quenching by molecular oxygen. Now, molecular oxygen is a little oddity. It is... Um, It is 3O2. Um, if we just think of a very quick MO diagram, we can see it's like this. And the excited states of molecular oxygen um, is this version, where I've got um, anti-parallel spins here. So this is 1O2. This is the excited state here. Um, and just like we have to have conservation of energy and conservation of angular momentum, we have to have conservation of spin. And so if I've got a dye which is in its singlet state, a uh, singlet excited state, uh, normally we would say that for emission we would have it going to the ground state and it would giving out light. But in this case, I'm suggesting that... Um, Sorry, I'm suggesting that in the presence of molecular oxygen, what I end up with is an excited state oxygen, but that leaves me having to have a triplet dye. It's the only way I can conserve spin. So this is now going to be triplet. Um, and so the scenario basically is that... Um, if I want to show this is happening, how could I verify um, the presence of a triplet? Well, the first thing I did, actually, was to see if, if it was likely there was a triplet. And that's that I looked for emission um, from single oxygen. Um, this is around 1280 nanometers. The reason I did this was because if I've got singular oxygen, I know that I'm looking in the right direction. If instead the oxygen isn't being excited, there's no reason for me to look for a triplet. So once I've got this, what did I do? Well, I um, changed tack slightly, moved away from the emission type thing. Uh, I tried to look for emission from the triplets. There was nothing at all to be seen at wavelengths longer than the fluorescence uh, emission. Um, and so I couldn't see emission from the triplet. And so then I had to use transient absorption. And so I'm looking for transient absorption in the UV vis. Um, in this case, I needed to do two experiments, um, one with O2 and one without So, presence um, of oxygen and no oxygen. And that's basically mirroring the st steady state experiments that I did. Um, and in this case, you can see peaks appearing in the oxygen scenario that we don't see in the other one. So, the second case, just a quick recap again. Uh, this was this ruthenium carbonyl thing. Um, there are advantages to using this um, tetracarbonyl in that this has no chirality, so I can see the LDR of the um, CO4 DPPZ, um, or, C or the CD, but LDR um, in this case was the simplest one to look at. But there are problems with doing that in that um, this Fen compound um, 
is chiral. It has delta and lambda um, isomers. Um, but basically, what I'm saying is, if this DPPC wants to intercalate for the um, tetracarbonyl, there's a good chance that this fen will as well. Um, and so, in part, it, it's just a simple case of um, looking at the um, at the CD and the LD for the tetracarbonyl, but that's more complicated for the uh, fen because it's chiral already, and so the, the, the spectra get an awful lot more complicated. I'm not just looking at induced chirality. I already have some chirality, and so you can look at it with changes of the... Um, of the chirality and see and see what we get, and you can also compare the delta and the lambda and see how they compare. Um, but another way to do it is looking at anisotropy. Um, we will see a different anisotropy for, for if we have my dye binding kind of here than if I have my side binding here. So this one here is bigger, therefore it will have a um, slower decay of the anisotropy to this one where it actually intercalates. Um, slightly less spectroscopic methods, but methods that people have used would be um, X-ray crystallography, Um, I know that people have, have managed to get some um, successful crystals of the, the ruthenium complexes. And NMR can also be used. The other thing we could look at is we could look at um, the transient absorption. Uh, oh, sorry, we could look at just simple infrared. Um, when we see ultra... Um, high resolution infrared um, you can start to kind of look for characteristics in the binding as well but my first bet here would be um, LDR and anisotropy and so the problems with the fen complexes is that the fen complexes are already chiral this one here was um, some work I, I've done on um, these polymer liquid crystals um, it just so happens that azo groups are really good in the Raman, but I wouldn't be judging if you said Raman or infrared. But the important thing here is that I've asked about um, stability and, more importantly, bonding here. Um, and so I've asked, you know, if we're, if we're using them in displays, we need to have them in an excited state um, so that we can see the emission from them. And um, And so... The fact that these I am looking for emission from these liquid crystals, um, or you know, colour from these liquid crystals, there could be problems here with just having steady state Raman because I could see um fluorescence emission. So that potentially could be um an issue. Um We use Raman. The azo group shows up really, really well in Raman. And so that was actually where we started off with. Um, and the other details about uh, the molecules, again, um, Raman was a better choice. Um, and the fact that we can actually get Raman microscopes as well, that we can look at particular areas, helps. Uh, but infrared would work just as well. But the po the key thing is, I'm looking for bonding. So I'm looking for small shifts in vibrations because I'm looking at how, you know, if I've got the difference between if I have my azo group, um, this happened to go off to a couple of ring systems. Um, if I've got hydrogen bonding here, and then I have an excited state, you know, I'm potentially going to break that hydrogen bonding or whatever it is. And and so I'm going to be looking for small changes in the infrared um, or vibrational signals. So Raman here um, and IR. But because I am looking at...
the excited state, these should really be time resolved. Um, that would be kind of my, my key. So either looking at TR cubed or, um, or transient absorption infrared. The final case is the one we didn't really discuss. Um, this is actually a very famous experiment by uh, led to the yellow leaves who showed that the electron sits on just one of the BIPI ligands. It doesn't kind of spread out over all of them, which at the time was quite a, a surprising find. She found this by electrochemistry, but after this initial result, there were all sorts of kind of spectroscopic kind of ways of looking at it as well, and people were really interested. Here we have um, emission at 354 nanometers, and um, essentially what we have is we have our metal and we excite up here um, and then we see this intersystem crossing. So this is my metal and so I have my um, electron here which gets excited up. I'm just putting the one in even though I know there's more than one um, and that electron ultimately after a few picoseconds ends up here. So this is the ligand. And so I have this charge transfer between the metal and the ligand. Um, so how could we show this is located on, on just one of my um, BIPI ligands? Um, well, this is a case of, again, you know, do your background work. Work out what... Um, so this is BIPI here, sorry. Oh, it helps if I put the nitrogens on. This is Bippy here. Um, so look at just the ligand. Look at the excited state of the ligand. Um, and then see if we can actually get the ligand to have a negative charge on it. So, you know, can I get it in a salt uh, where it's carrying a negative charge? These nitrogens will semi-happily take the negative charge on these ring systems. So, you know, getting it as a negative charge isn't a big thing. And so I know that a lithium salt exists for, for this. Um, but again, that means that I've then got the BIPI on its own, the BIPI with the negative charge. And now I can start to see in my spectra, do I have the BIPI on its own? Do I have the BIPI with the negative charge? And again, we want to be using something like um, transient absorption to do this. The reason being it will get rid of all the, everything that hasn't been excited into the, this excited state. So here I'm going to recommend transient absorption and I'm going to recommend transient absorption infrared. Um, the reason being that there's going to be a difference in the vibrations of these BIPI rings if there is a negative charge on them. So it makes sense to kind of look at my transient absorption infrared. Again, if you want to use Raman, you know, Raman's looking at much the same things. It's just how active these things are, one over the other. Um, but what we can actually see is we can see small changes to the other BIPIs because they're in the uh, presence of a negative, you know, essentially a change in charge distribution. That We see small changes in those, but we see much, much bigger changes for um, a small part of it. So it's this combination of small changes for this and a much, much bigger change when I have one with the negative charge on that tells us I've got two distinct environments. I hope this little podcast has helped. Um, please ask in the forum if you've got any questions.